Good morning. And welcome to worship all of you in the sanctuary and those who are joining us via Armstrong Cable on our Facebook page or on our website. Uh, it is good we can be together here on this uh, first Sunday of July in the day in which we in America call uh, Independence Day. So we uh, have many things to celebrate. You've already noted that Jim is at the piano, not the organ. Um, and I think everyone here in the sanctuary and many of you at home uh, were made aware that uh, yesterday was to be Jim's organ concert celebrating uh, this, uh, our nation's birthday and uh, some beautiful organ pieces of patriotic hymns and uh, songs. And when he came in on Wednesday, the um, organ, we'll just say, wasn't working right. Yeah, he nods, yes. It wasn't working right. And so even after the organ tech came uh, in and checked on it, there was no way to uh, repair it soon enough to be able to have that concert yesterday. So um, we are planning to reschedule as soon as we are able to. Uh, Jim said, you know how we sometimes celebrate Christmas in July? Well, this might be 4th of July at Christmas. But um, we, we anticipated being repaired before that. But I want to thank Jim for uh, being able to adjust so quickly as he's been practicing for the organ and now this morning is, is able to be on the piano. So we give, we give thanks for this day and uh, for Jim and and uh, his gifts, as well as the gifts of so many others. So although yesterday uh, the event was canceled, worship is still worship. We gather to give thanks for God's presence in this particular day. This morning we again celebrate communion. So for those of you in the sanctuary, uh, hopefully when you came in, uh, you picked up on your way in the little baggie. Uh, we are still celebrating communion in this way. We have uh, inside of it, we have the small cup. At the time uh, uh, when uh, we celebrate communion, we will uh, hold the cup up, tear the, the uh, paper off where the small piece of bread is, uh, take the bread, and then when the time comes, uh, take also off the, the uh, paper from the top and drink of the cup. So um, we continue to say, this is not ideal, but we recognize that Christ is with us in whatever way that we can take it. Ah, so that, that's behind us. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. I'd invite you this morning to uh, turn to the screens here in the sanctuary or at home to join in our responsive prayer for this day, uh, a prayer for our country that comes to us from our uh, United Methodist hymnal. Oh God, keep our whole country under your protection. Lift it up from the depth of sorrow, O Lord, our shining light. Save us from deep grief and misfortune, O Lord of all nations. Your wisdom, so that the poor may not be oppressed and the rich may not be the oppressors. Make this nation, having no ruler except God, a nation having no authority but that of love. Amen. In our opening hymn, God of the Ages, we will be singing verses 1 and 2. Thank you. 
Many of you may have also recognized that as the tune to Allegheny's alma mater. So uh, we all kind of celebrate uh, our connection there this morning as well. So this uh, past Wednesday in our e-news, I quoted the opening to our Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. What we know now about our forefathers was when they said that, their vision wasn't quite expanded yet to include all men. Um, at the time of the writing, and this is no curse on them, but it's the truth of the day in which they lived, when they wrote that, our understanding is they meant white land-owning men. Um, and that we as a people have grown to understand that in this country to be much broader, to include women and our indigenous people to include persons of color. So as we have expanded our understanding as a nation, we give thanks for that. And we give thanks for all the people along the way that have helped us as a nation, as Americans, to understand the breadth of what freedom and liberty would look like for all people. Um, one of my favorite pieces, and it's come to be one of my favorite books over these last few years, is uh, this book based on Langston Hughes's poem, My People. Langston Hughes was a poet, an important person in the Harlem Renaissance in the 20s. He was born in 1902 and lived into the 60s. And in writing this book, and now the um, person whose name is Charles Smith, who provided the uh, pictures, celebrates that my people are also including, I want you to remember the day in which he was writing, to expand that my people also included all the beautiful children and adults and young people of color. And so this morning, it's just a few stanzas of the work by Langston Hughes, My People. The night is beautiful. So the faces of my people. The stars are beautiful. So the eyes. of my people. Beautiful also is the sun and beautiful also are the souls of my people. So I give thanks today for people like Langston Hughes who helped us understand that America is bright and beautiful in all of its color. And now Jim is gonna bring us a special piece of music celebrating this day.
Ah. So this past month, we have been paying attention to questions that the Apostle Paul asked of the early believers in what we know as the first letter of Corinthians. This morning, the question that we are looking at is a very short one. The Apostle Paul said, am I not free? But we're going to look at it in a broader perspective of the whole letter and what it might mean to us. So as we move into both this uh, time of uh, hearing scripture and also thinking about it, let us pray. Oh God, we thank you for this freedom to worship this morning. Hmm. Help us not take that for granted, a freedom to worship, that we can be here. Thank you for your word that has come down to us for, uh, through centuries of believers who have told the stories of Jesus and have read these words of Paul and have bring them to us this day. So open our hearts and our heads and our spirits that we might live out of your word in a way that reflects your love in the way of your son Jesus the Christ. So make your presence known here with us. In Christ's name we do pray. Amen. A week ago this past Saturday, two of our grandsons, uh, Carter and Ben, were ring bearers in the wedding of a dear friend of ours, Lauren Mullins. The day of the rehearsal, a week ago Friday, Ben, who is six, and I had been out to Roach Park and we were coming back into town, we were heading back to our home and, uh, on, Arch Street, went, uh, on Arch Street when we passed St. Bridget's Church, where the wedding was to be held. A few moments after we passed the church, Ben pipes up from the back seat. Is it illegal to not go to a wedding you've been invited to? Now, that's making you think that he's having some serious second doubts about being a, the ring bearer. Is it illegal to not go to a wedding that you've been invited to? The question was, how bad would it be if I didn't do this? That's, that's kind of what he wanted to know. How much trouble would I get into? So, of course, it opened up this time for this wonderful conversation that, no, it's not illegal, um, but it wouldn't be nice, right? It wouldn't be nice. Because Lauren is counting on you to be there. And you've got your snappy new clothes with suspenders and a bow tie. And everyone will be glad to see you. And you will be part of this big celebration. And so from the back seat, a quiet and maybe a little begrudging, okay, and the next day, both Ben and his brother Carter, who's two, did a wonderful job of walking down the aisle and carrying the rings. But it was fascinating to me how a question from a six-year-old could connect with scripture written almost 2,000 years ago. Because this early Christian church, and again, I keep emphasizing, these were early Christians. These are not non-believers. These are people who've... Uh, in the earliest days have come to commit their lives to this new way that they understand of living in faith. But what they've struggled to figure out and that Paul is addressing with them throughout this whole letter is, what can they do and what can they not do? What are they free to do and what are they not free to do? Now that they've accepted the message of salvation through Jesus Christ. Most of these early believers, including Paul, believed that Christ's return, that the second coming was going to be very soon, right? And so um, it was urgent. It was urgent in a certain way about what you came to believe, but it also had an influence on how you were going to live. Others believed that uh, if salvation was a spiritual reality, then it really didn't matter what you did with your bodies. It didn't matter how you lived because... You were saved. And then there were the ongoing questions in that early community is, how do they distinguish themselves from the pagans who also believed in a god and worshipped a god or gods in form of idols? 
They had this ongoing question which you can uh, look at. It's kind of fascinating, actually, in, the first, in 1 Corinthians about ought Christians eat food that had been offered to idols first? And that is a question that seems like it wouldn't relate to us, but it does in a really, uh, in a different way. But the main thing, again, here is what of these things was illegal for Christians? How were they to live out their freedom in Christ? Now, in two different places in 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 6, 12 and 10, 23, Paul writes these identical words. All things are lawful for me, but then adds in, in chapter 6, but not all things are beneficial. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. All things are lawful for me, he writes in uh, chapter 10, verse 23. All things are lawful for me, but not all things build up. It's like, isn't that still true? Like you can do all kinds of things that you're free to do, but they're not good for us. And they don't build up the community. Paul adds then, do not seek your own advantage, but that of the other. You're free to do anything within reason. Paul is saying to this early group of believers, you're free to do whatever, but not all of it is good for you. Not all of it builds up the community. While some of the issues Paul addresses are not issues in our day, as I said, the food offered to eat to idols, both the depth of concern and the breadth of scope speaks directly to us in our day, in our church, and in our nation in 2021. Just because we're free to do something, should we? Hmm. Is it good for us individually, whatever the choice might be? But Paul's greater concern would be, is it good for the broader community? Do the choices we make serve the common good? If we, in fact, are what we say we are, free in Christ, what are we free for? What are we free for? I want to read you a passage from 1 Corinthians 15, when Paul addresses this very thing. Now I remind you, brothers and sisters of the good news that I proclaimed to you, which you in turn received, in which you also stand, through which you are also being saved, if you hold firmly to the message that I proclaim to you, unless you have come to believe in vain. For I handed on to you, as of first importance, what I in turn had received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, and that he was buried and he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. And that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters at one time. Most of them are still alive, but some have died. Then he appeared to James and then to all the apostles. And then last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles unfit to be even called one, because I persecuted the church. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. Just by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me has not been in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is within me. Whatever then it was, I or they, so we proclaim, and you have come to believe. Paul uses his freedom for the good of all. He claims, though, in it all that it is Christ in him, and that by the grace of God, he is who he is, by the grace of God. So as we, you know, reflect this day on freedom... What it means to us as Christians and as a nation, how we're to live, how we're to love, how we're to care for one another. I invite us to take very seriously these words of Paul. 
Free for what? Free for who? When we use our freedom, for whose benefit is it? We are who we are by the grace of God. So let's live into that this day. As we prepare for communion, which is, as Christians, what helps root and ground us in the grace of God, I invite you to prayerfully pray and sing um, the first two verses of the hymn, Have Thine Own Way. earliest writings of Paul, he includes these words about the institution of the Lord's Supper. Paul writes this in 1 Corinthians 11, beginning with verse 23. For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took a loaf of bread, and when he'd given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, That is for you, do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup also after the supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you will reclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So in the name of Jesus Christ and in his peace and power, I offer this bread, blessed and broken. This is Christ's body given for you and for the whole world. Now I would invite you to take your cup and eat of the bread. Christ's body given for you for the forgiveness of your sins and the sins of the whole world. And after the meal, Christ took the cup and blessed it. He offered it and said, this is the cup of the new covenant poured out for the forgiveness of your sins and the sins of many. Whenever you drink of this, do so in memory of me. Now together we take of this cup, remembering that Christ offered his whole life for us, for the forgiveness of our sins. And we sing now, verses 3 and 4 of Have Your Own Way, Lord.
that is our prayer, right? That everyone would see Christ living in us. And as we commit our lives to Christ, we commit our time, our energy, and our resources. This morning, we pause to give thanks for all that we have been given and all that you have given, whether it be in the offering plate this morning, online, or so very many ways, to sustain Christ's ministry through Stone Church. So let us pause for a moment and bless these great gifts. O oh God, all that we have is yours. We humbly acknowledge that. And so we offer these financial gifts this morning. Those that have come here this morning and those that have found their way to the church in these last weeks. Oh God, bless the use of these resources that we might be good stewards of all that we have been given and that ministry might continue to be done in your name. Amen. Amen. We have so much to be thankful for this day. A long list of thanks that have come before me. Uh, the flowers on our altar this morning are uh, in recognition and uh, thanksgiving for uh, Joyce and Dick Minnis' 53rd wedding anniversary. So uh, we celebrate with them. I also know uh, Chuck and Lisa Faust celebrate their anniversary this day. Um, we celebrate uh, family visits and incredible doctors and treatments. I continue to hear stories of persons and uh, moments of healing. We celebrate weddings and we celebrate being part of this nation and our history, the parts that are good and glorious and we also commit ourselves to a change that would be good and holy for all people. This morning, we celebrate a new appointment year for United Methodist clergy and churches within our annual conference. Lots of change, and this morning, I uh, will be preaching at 1030 for the first time at Bethany. So um, I ask your prayers for that as we begin that new venture together. Oh, we also have a number of uh, prayers that have been lifted up before us. Uh, this morning, I would ask for your prayers for... Laura Reek and her family, uh, her father died suddenly uh, and unexpectedly out in Kansas this past Wednesday. And so she and uh, her family are mourning his loss. I've also been asked to lift up uh, prayers for a, a dear friend and neighbor, Jim, who has been diagnosed with cancer of the esophagus and will begin treatment in, within this next week or two. We have uh, many prayers uh, that have been asked of us for safe travels for family. We've been also asked to lift up those that are always in danger's way from one way or the other, uh, whether it be uh, from hurricanes that ravage places or drought and fires in other places. We pray for uh, those families that continue to grieve and, um, at the collapse of that condominium in Florida. We also continue to pray for places around the world uh, that are in serious conflict. And this morning, again, we lift up uh, Israel and Palestine. So many things in our hearts, in our heads, and we're just going to trust that God knows. So as Jim calls us into prayer now, let us quiet our hearts and our heads. God, thank you for hearing us, for knowing us, for loving us, for correcting us, for forgiving us, for leading us back like sheep, coming to find us when we're lost, for drawing us together as your people, whether we can physically be together or we find ourselves this morning physically apart, but together in spirit. Oh God, thank you. Thank you for the beauty of this season, for the loveliness of your creation, for flowers and vegetables and fruits, for people of all kinds and colors, for family and friends, for healing and hope, 
for freedom that we often take for granted. Thank you, O Lord. On this day, we have offered our thanks, and in our hearts, we have specific joys that we lift before you now. Oh Lord, we've lifted up the names of some that we know who are in great need this day. But oh God, you know the other names and situations in our hearts and our heads. We lift them up to you right now. Oh, Lord, you know us, all the broken places in our lives, all of our wounds, all of the ways and things we've done or failed to do, things we've said or failed to say that have not given you glory, that have not allowed your light to shine in us. And so we humbly now offer our confession. Oh God, we accept your forgiveness. We accept your forgiveness with the promise that we will live into all that you have called us to be always through the grace of Jesus Christ. And so hear us now as one people, as one family, as we pray together with the words that we have been taught to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And so as I send you forth, I uh, pray you'll have a safe 4th of July celebration. Keep, keep an eye on our Facebook or on our website or call the church office if you need to follow up and we will look forward again to the um, concert, yesterday's concert to be rescheduled hopefully before uh, too long. And again, I want to thank Jim this morning for making this adjustment to be able to uh, go from the organ to piano. Not everybody can do that. So thanks, Jim. He says, ah, ah, but it's... Uh, It's a gift. I most appreciate that. So with that, let us, uh, those who are able, stand. Otherwise, remain in your seats. And we are going to sing the closing two verses of God of the Ages.
Go forth now in the peace of Jesus Christ and the love of your creator. Go forth to be the people God created you to be. In the name of the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.